session, each for 15 minutes. The first one will be presented by the Tommy Tsuminen from the CSC from Finland. And the paper is entitled Linking SSA Research Publications, Datasets and Infrastructures in Research Research.fi, which should be the new platform in, in Finland, which should be, uh, let's say, the CRIS National CRIS Systems or something as that. So uh, Tommy is the first author of the paper, and uh, this is a collaborative paper. The other authors are Jonas Nikanen, Tuma Salatera, and Tony Sisala. Uh, Tommy is a partially sustainability scientist, part, part information system designer. So Tommy Sumer is an uh, interdisciplinary expert focusing on the software solution development for various research needs with working experience from both science and the industry. In his present role uh, as an, an information uh, architect at CSC, he focuses on information modeling for IT services in research and, and education, recently launched research.fi in particular. Uh, persistent identifiers have risen in relevance as a means of interconnecting related data objects. Also, persistent identifiers are in his uh, area of interest. So, uh, Tommy, you have, uh, let's say, 10 minutes or a little bit more for presentations and a couple of minutes for uh, questions and discussions with the audience. All right. Thank you very much. I'll try to be quick then. Um, yeah. So, hi, I'm Tommy. Um, I will go right into it as um, we are not having so much time. Let's see if now they're moving. Um, so um, this is kind of an, uh, the beginning of the conference paper we submitted, and it's also a shout out to yesterday's vocabulary session. So um, I wrote the beginning of our conference paper uh, in such a way that uh, specific contexts are references uh, to uh, controlled vocabulary, a controlled ontological vocabulary on research um, management. So basically these all refer to specified concepts uh, with the meanings behind them. So um, the coverage of a different kind of research outputs um, for social sciences and humanities is lower than for many other fields compared to, for example, natural sciences. Now, um, one way to address this is national data collection. Uh, what we have been building is a national CRIS system. Uh, there are also others such as the Christine and Narcis. And um, this is uh, an attempt to uh, bring more balance between disciplines in their coverage of research outputs. Um, they aggregate information from different research organizations and possibly some disciplinary repositories. So um, to achieve this kind of an already national level harmonization, uh, the metadata for research outputs needs to be consistent, interoperable, and uh, how that can be, because the, of course the metadata schemas in different disciplines are different uh, due to the uh, dis disciplinary details. So there needs to be some form of um, crosswalks between the um, different uh, disciplinary schemas, while of course recognizing that uh, uh, you can't map disciplinary details so not the discipline where they don't exist. So a common metadata schema such as SERI, for example, can, ask, uh, um, can act as an inter uh, intermediator to, um, so that you ma make a mapping from schema A to SERIF and from schema uh, SERIF to schema B. And then if you want to add another mapping, you can just add, add a mapping from Serif to C and that enables you to go from A to C without actually making a mapping between A and C directly. So how to achieve this interoperability of metadata is a question and a, a challenge to be addressed still. Um, however, one of the main things that uh, needs to be there that is just a precondition is that we have persistent identifiers to enable unambiguous uh, references to all the different research outputs. So the research.fi service, it aggregates together uh, currently publications, uh, research funding decisions, here called projects, uh, research data, uh, research infrastructures and different research performing organizations and research funding organizations. We are uh, um, awaiting a legal change that is related to the personal information processing 
that will enable us to uh, make this revolve around the researchers themselves so that the um, researchers will be connected to all their uh, different uh, research objects. And we can make researcher profiles within this uh, service. So, um, in addition to collecting all these things uh, together into one national portal, currently they are coming all from uh, the different objects from different places. Um, in addition, we try to um, use the natural language that is there describing, for example, research uh, other funding decisions with uh, concepts from ontological vocabulary so that we can later uh, implement semantic searching for uh, knowledge discovery within the whole uh, entirety of the service. So how does this work? <clears throat> in the case of research data sets, um, we uh, bring in data from disciplinary and organizational uh, repositories, such as the Finnish Society for Social Sciences uh, Data Archive, uh, universities. So uh, uh, these um, are then, of course, described using their own uh, metadata schemas. And this needs to be crosswalked in some way to the fair data uh, information model. Um, the FSD exposes their metadata descriptions currently uh, to be harvestable via OIA PMH. And um, then fair data itself um, uh, provides its data via OIA PMH or a RIST API, exposes its own data model, and provides crosswalks, for uh, example, to data site and DDI. Now, research.fi reads directly from uh, fairdata.fi. Um, here's an example of a data set in uh, the FSD. This is uh, harvested. It is uh, uh, visible in fairdata.fi. And to, um, yeah, to mention also, fairdata.fi also has data deposition and data collection. It is not merely a metadata aggregate. So it has um, the bulk of its data sets are directly deposited and not uh, harvested from other services. And then uh, eventually the same uh, data set uh, is um, displayed in the research.fi where it can be linked then to publications, people, projects, infrastructures, uh, research activities and organizations. So collecting all this uh, information on the different research objects uh, is one thing I and mean, it is a lot of work uh, and we need to interface with numerous different data sources but producing the information on the interconnections between the research objects is uh, at least as big a challenge the collection of, and production of this data is still much more uh, scattered and incomprehensible compared to the objects themselves so uh, connections pit to pit makes a big graph so for the information on connections between research objects to be reliable and ambiguous, we must make these connections as a, a relation between a, a PID and a PID. And in the absence of identifiers, uh, we are left with uh, vague text or local identifiers. And if you want to transfer information from a system to another system, that can't understand the target of, an, uh, ident um, of the other object that you're trying to link to if that's not identified using a PID. Basically, the kind of transfer, transferability of the information suffers. There is, um, you can't identify just the strings or um, local identifiers. So what are the sources of connection information? Um, when the author, an author is giving information on a research object, um, the optimal case is that they provide a PID for the connection that they're building. It could also be author provided without a PID, and so that's just the title of a publication, for example, or inferred. So I mean, sorry, we have a problem to hear you in some moments. It seems as the microphone is not so close to your mouth or something as that. So when you move a little bit far, farther yeah. than further than we have a problem. Yeah, so I must speak this way. I I'll try to keep my head straight. Um, so yeah, the author provided information could also be seen as curated versus um, machine generated information. From FSD, we do get some information on connections related to the funding decisions and publications related to data sets. However, uh, these are sometimes just text uh, with local identifiers and it doesn't help us to build this uh, graph information. Um, the development is underway also for the um, publication information collection to incorporate pitted references in the publication information collection we're performing. So uh, while this was the um, figure for how we produced the um, information on the data,
data sets, we have uh, parallel um, structures for uh, collecting the data, for example, for, uh, for, for publications, where the sources are the university's own CRISIS. Uh, we get in, uh, publication information from ORCID, which in turn gets it from Scopus, Crossref, and uh, the researchers. Now, um, so we have these parallel initiatives, which also produce uh, some limited amount of connection data on how these publications are connected to, for example, data sets. So we get information from both sides. Now, funding decisions um, might also uh, be a place where we can get connection information as researchers reporting to the donors on their use of the fundings might report the publications they made with the uh, funding or the data sets that they produced using this funding. So we have various different places of information that where, where the kind of the scattered uh, connection information that can be harvested from. So um, it's a bit of an issue that uh, the author, authors are not always aware of the PIDs, don't have them on hand, and then they are asked to fill a form full of uh, text for the metadata in these documents, and that's not a really good situation. So the idea is that the research at FI will produce, provide an API uh, where services such as the FSD or FairData.fi can access this pitted metadata so that when the author is creating the connection, they directly get uh, the entire metadata for uh, behind the PID and can just basically uh, create the PID to PID connection in the service uh, in a much more practical manner. And this generates uh, better quality metadata just at the source where the data is initially provided. Now, um, Additionally, once we have generated this uh, higher quality metadata and parsed it together from different sources, we can all cater it back to the data sources where they came from, such as the FSD, as uh, it might have gotten enriched with new uh, metadata from the different data collection sources so that it actually can then in turn receive the um, improved metadata uh, with the improved connection information uh, accessible from research.fi via APIs. So we're still not here, but there. Um, this has been an example, the presentation I'm currently giving. Um, uh, where do I provide the information on this presentation to the e uh, ICT ESSH conference, which should be having an identi unique identifier, to the related conference paper, which should be having an unique identifier in the proceedings, which is a collection with an identifier to the other authors or kids, of which there are four, to the FSD resource infrastructure, an identifier, and the two services, which should be having identifiers, and to all the organizational affiliations of the authors in the context of this presentation. And all this should be provided in a machine actionable format. So all these different identifier types make it a bit difficult to operate in this environment. And one of the observations is that we do need some form of a global PID resolver that can basically resolve any PID uh, and just uh, return uh, uh, the address that it points to where the metadata is uh, available and the data sets for the publications are available, or alternatively, uh, machine actionably, so that it, it, it gets returned all the metadata behind that PID so that we can offer that this in an API ma type manner uh, to uh, the re uh, party who is doing the um, asking of the metadata. So I'm uh, finishing at 14 minutes. I'm sorry I didn't manage quite the 10 minutes, but um, if you want to talk on these topics, please get in touch. Um, I find it a very interesting domain of information and I'm happy to talk more on this. Yeah, Tommy, thank you very much for, for a nice presentation. And uh, I'm really happy to see that there is a progress in, in Finland, of course, in this aspect. <laughs> Uh, we have one question here in uh, in Q and A uh, from Carol Gobel. How does this Finnish work relate to open air research graph and data site PID graph? Good question. Um, <clears throat> open air currently already harvests uh, our information on the publications, so um, open air. Um, we have ma made the uh, publication information, which is public information, harvestable. And uh, this is something that we aggregate from all the different universities and uh, research institutes in Finland. And this is made available. Um, currently, there are legal barriers to making um, available, which is 
sort of GDPR and the Finnish equivalent related uh, um, issues that we have to overcome, uh, which is why we're changing the legislation in Finland to allow combining this information from different sources, because this becomes a new registry to which for uh, the people who are there, the researchers might not have given consent. So we have to um, address these issues. But um, I just had a meeting with Open Air last week and I um, communicate with them quite actively. And uh, the idea is that this would, um, the bulk of our national curated good quality data would then be also um, made available to open air uh, as a part of their um, knowledge graph or research graph. Uh, the data side bit graph, I um, am currently working on discussing with uh, data site. And um, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, um, we have, of course, richer metadata than just the bit to bit connections on all the different research objects. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I've read on their PID graph approach, but I haven't uh, looked into it in deep enough detail to be, uh, give you, uh, to be able to give you a good answer. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not sure that we have uh, more time for the discussion, unfortunately. Right. But generally speaking, I'm also a um, supporter of this idea of linking data and using the PIDs. So building that, let's say, the global distributed system for research domain across the world. And then you can, you know, collect whatever information you need about some person or some project or whatever. And have complete uh, picture about that domain, of course. So uh, we have here, I think, two, two more questions in Q&A. So, Tommy, it would be great if you can, you know, uh, type the answer. Do you see the Q&A sure. box? Yes, I do. Uh, because we have to go further without program, but it would be nice, of course, to provide the responses to the persons who raise the questions there. OK. Sure. We are going further. Um, I'm going now to introduce the next speaker and next, next paper. Uh, the paper is uh, entitled and uh, extended model for historical financial data with an application to German company and stock market data. And the presenter will be Pantelis Karapanayotis, who actually uh, pre-recorded the video, which we are going to play it right now. And then uh, Panayotis, Pantelis sorry, will be there for, for any, any question. And beside Pantelis, there is uh, four more uh, authors, Dennis Graham, Pantelis Karapanayotis, Jan Krizanowski, Marius Liebald, and Uwe Waltz. Uh, Thanks. So just briefly about the Pantelis. So after studying mathematics and economics, Pantelis received his PhD in quantitative economics from the Goethe University of Frankfurt in December 2020. So congratulations, it was recently actually. Currently, he works as a researcher at Goethe University. He's also a member of his firm's working group of identification and standards. His current primary research focus on industrial organization of financial markets and the design of big data system with financial data. So I'm going to try to play the video. And as I said, you will be able to raise the questions directly to Pantelis after the presentation. Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to briefly present to you my joint work with Dennis Kram, Jan Krizanowski, Marius Libart and Uwe Valls, titled An Extensible Model for Historical Financial Data with an Application to German Company and Stock Market Data. My name is Padelis Karpanayotis, I'm an assistant professor at TPS University in Wiesbaden and I'm also a research affiliate of uh, the Leibniz Institute SAFE. Constructing historical databases turn out to be unexpectedly challenging. There are two main problems that are specifically severe when it comes to historical databases. Firstly, historical data sources are highly non-harmonized and non-standardized. And secondly, the actual accuracy of the historical content is difficult or on some occasions impossible to verify. I have here on this slide a very small example that can help me illustrate this point and further motivate the subsequent discussion. You can see that there are two snippets taken from two different historical sources. 
The left snippet is taken from the 1818s yearbook published by the governing body of the Parisian Stock Exchange, while the right snippet comes from the Curtis yearbook of 1874. Both snippets report dividends paid by the Société Générale de Crédit Industriel et Commercial. I'm sorry for the accent, unfortunately I do not speak French. And the records overlap from 1859 to 1872. Information, however, does not always coincide. For instance, as you can see, the left snippet does not report dividends on the years 1859 to 1863, while the right snippet does so. From a data modeling perspective, this difference is relatively innocuous. Both of these data sources suggest that a data model for this type of data should have a dividend element, and if one source has missing information and this information is later located in another source, there is no need to update the data model. There is only need to insert the new data into the database. The situation can get a bit more complicated when the sources contain conflicting information. As an example, in 1866, the source on the left snippet suggests that the paid dividend was 12.5 francs, while the source on the right snippet suggests that it was 23.75 francs. In addition, if one checks the surrounding years, namely 65 and 67, she observes that both sources agree that the paid dividend was around 23 to 24 francs. So it is rather tempting for one to guess that the source on the right might have the correct dividend. However, as the observant part of the audience might have already noticed, both sources report a paid dividend of 12.5 francs in 1870, only four years after 66, and therefore it is also not unreasonable to assume that the actual paid dividend in 1866 might as well be 12.5 francs. So, as you can see, a case of conflicting info gives a bit more serious trouble than a mere case of missing information. Because now we have ambiguous beliefs about the correct dividend value, and if we want to construct a data model that can support an extensible research infrastructure driven by verifiable content, we should find a way to endorse these types of peculiarities in historical data and describe the ambiguity of the sources. These types of difficulties, together with the significant cost of extracting data from the historical sources, led to a substantial deficit of infrastructures with financial history data in Europe. As a result, most financial history research uses US data, because the situation in the US is arguably better. Perhaps the flagship of historical financial database in the US is CRISP, which stands for Center in Research for Research in Security Prices, and offers data that go back to 1925 or so. This is of course quite nice for the US, but can we safely extrapolate the US lessons to other regions, for instance European regions? This is not so straightforward to do. As for instance Dimson, Mars and Stanton argue, the performance of the US stock market during the 20th century constitutes more of an outlier rather than the typical case. Therefore, if we estimate a variable using US data, we might be overestimating or underestimating the corresponding variable for a European country. The aspiring counterpart of CRISP in Europe is called Eurisphere. This is a project that aims to provide a European-wide research infrastructure that will close the gap between Europe and the US when it comes to the availability of financial history data. Our project is associated with Eurisphere. But besides ours, there were also other attempts to set up historical databases with financial data, with some of them being quite successful and long-lived. The first reference here that you see on the slides is associated with the DEFI project, which is perhaps the most advanced European database offering financial instrument, financial statement and corporate governance data. The second reference is associated with SCOPE, perhaps the oldest European database that's offering the same type of data, uh, but now for Belgian firms. Our goal in this paper is to propose a design that takes into account the peculiarities of the historical financial data in a way that allows the schematic or semantic representations of the data to be easily maintainable. Our main priority is our database design to be extensible and easily adaptable to potential future needs and changes. 
Ideally, we would also like to illustrate this attribute by our use case. In this respect, we contribute in the literature in the following ways. Firstly, we introduce and discuss the design principle of preserving historical sources. Data models that comply with this principle fully capture the provenance characteristics of the data, have attractive extensibility attributes, and enhanced content verification capabilities. Secondly, we illustrate the initial steps that we took for the construction of a German financial history database that we are developing and we would also like to use as our use case. The starting point of the preservation principle is merely to admit that the historical content is not perfectly separable from its sources. Even worse, valuable today's practices such as unique identification and standardization, which are typically found in contemporary databases, are not present in the sources. Standardization in particular is a very important attribute to have when you are constructing a database, as it imposes a form of content invariance. Once you have a standard, it is not relevant, at least not that relevant anymore, the exact digital format of the data or the database technology that powers your infrastructure. Having a standard allows you to have very strong expectations about the content of the data and their interpretability. Unfortunately, such an invariance is not present in historical sources. Nevertheless, the sources themselves are invariant in the sense that there is a finite number of historical archives that are available to us and there is no way that we obtain information that extends beyond these archives. Thus, the idea of the principle is to use the invariance of the sources as the next best thing when standardization invariance is unavailable. We sketch a relational implementation of the principle, but in essence, our approach is technology independent. Any adherent implementation documents at least the following three components. Firstly, it documents publishing house information. Secondly, it documents the digitization output. And thirdly, it introduces an abstraction buffer that comes between the data sources and any content-related concept. The first component is there to document information about the publishers of historical sources. All the tables that you see on this slide belong on the same schema. We refer to this schema as the input layer because from an architectural perspective of the infrastructure, the historical sources constitute an input to our system. Publishers have a one-to-many relationship with sources, the titles of which are also stored separately because some of the sources are publication series that share the same title and we would like to avoid data duplication as much as possible. Furthermore, each one of our sources is related with one or more PDF files. This relationship is not there to support the fragmentation of the PDF of the historical archives, but it is rather there to support multiple versions which correspond to potentially different scans of the same historical archive. This feature is quite important for us because different scans have different qualities and give potentially different OCR output results which we are also interested in storing. The second component also belongs in the input schema. It picks up from where we were left in the first component, namely from the PDF sources. Every PDF source is associated with one or more scan pages. Whenever the pages are OCR processed, the text data output is stored alongside the scanned page. In addition, every page is associated with one or more lines. And for each OCR processed line, we also store the resulting text output. The heart of the principle of maintaining historical sources lies with the last component of our relational implementation. Starting from where we left, namely the lines, we introduce a many-to-many -many relationship with any concrete data modeling financial domain concept in which we are interested in. Examples of potential concepts of interest are the names of legal entities, the locations of these legal entities, and as well as the names and the roles of the persons involved in the governance structures of the legal entities. Why this many-to-many -many relationship is important? In the one direction, it might be the case that in a single line, we locate two or more distinct pieces of information that we would like to store. 
For instance, we might locate more than one both members, or we might locate both the capitalization and the address of the film in a single line. On the other direction, it might be the case that we locate the same film name, for instance, in multiple sources. Comparing this approach with existing designs, we see that both Scope and DEFI, which are among the most prominent database infrastructure uh, with European historical data, they use a one-to-one -one association between sources and data, which can be problematic in some cases, especially when we are dealing with sources that have conflicting information. In the last part of the presentation, I would like to take some time to illustrate some of the initial steps that we have already taken concerning collecting and linking data for our implementation. We have two main data sources. Firstly, the handbook Der Deutschen Axien Gesellschaften, which constitutes an unofficial but rather extensive registry of German public companies. And secondly, the Berliner Börse Zeitung, uh, which is a newspaper containing much more historical information that we need in our scope. But as far as it concerns our implementation, we only focus on the price lists of the financial instruments that are uh, reported in the newspaper. We primarily collect data from the handbooks using machine learning. We have 13 handbook volumes ranging from 1920 to 1932. We use Ocropile to extract the text data and we train our model using 200,000 iterations. Our error rate is around 3%. Our training subset consists of 60 pages and our test subset consists of 20 pages which were randomly selected and manually transcripted in both cases. In the newspapers we have around 2500 price list pages which we transcribe manually. There are of course many interesting linking issues that one comes across when she collects data. For example, names and addresses frequently change. On the left, we have an entry of a film called Berliner Maklerverein, which translates to Berlin Broker Association. While on the right, we have an entry of the film called Berliner Bankverein, which translates to Berlin Bank Association. These two films, as it is also indicated on the right snippet, they are actually the same entity. There was a name and potentially an objective change that took place in 1923. Currently, and in spite of these difficulties, we have managed to identify and interlink the vast majority of the films that are found in the handbook sources. On the left, you may see the number of identified films per handbook volume. The decreased number of observed films in 29 is due to an accounting report uh, reporting regime change. And because of this change, many films were reported either in the 28th or in the 30th volume. As you may also observe, on the right, the number of identified films follows a much more natural pattern when the plot is uh, done against the calendar years. With this, let me shortly reiterate on the main points that we have seen in this video. We can use the principle of preserving historical sources in order to design data models that have both enhanced invulnerability attributes and data verification capacities. We have sketched as our use case an implementation, a relational implementation of the design principle, and we have illustrated our preliminary collection and harmonization of German financial film level data. Our next steps will focus on bringing everything together and further developing a database driven infrastructure that can be used for research purposes. You may find more about the points that I have just recapped in the conference paper An Extensible Model for Historical Financial Data with an application to German company and stock market data. Let us know if you have any suggestions on how to improve our design and thank you for watching. So it's time now for the questions. Uh, unfortunately, in this session, we had a problem to hear the speakers so far. Um, so this was a little bit I hope at least the main messages were transmitted. Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. I, I could hear that, but you know, it could be a little bit more loud, but anyway. So do we have any question? There is one comment in the chat. Um, okay. So any question for Pantelis now, or maybe you can contact Pantelis after this session, of course. I believe he is willing to provide you the response to any, any question. Yep.
I'm not sure how many people we have from this field actually in, in, the, con in the conference from the, uh, let's say the economy and stock market and everything other. But anyway, it was interesting, I think, to, to provide some new infrastructure for some new domain. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if everyone needs any more information, we would be happy to provide it. Yeah, yeah, of course, thank you very much. Okay, then uh, I will introduce the next one speaker, uh, which should be the Akash Sharma. Sorry, Akash, if I wrongly pronounced your name. No, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the paper is entitled Accountable Human Subject Research Data Processing Using LOHI. The authors are Akash Sharma, uh, Thomas Bain Nielsen, Lars Brenna, Doug Johansen, and Howard D. Johansen. I think uh, this is the group of authors from Norway, right? Yes. And Akash is a PhD candidate at the Department of Computer Science at the Arctic University of Norway. His current research interests include distributed systems, privacy preserving technologies, and regulatory compliance. He holds a Master of Science in Distributed Software System from Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. Prior to his master's degree, he worked in different roles at Media Lab Asia, IBM, and Persistent Systems. So Akash, you have a, a little bit more than 10 minutes for your presentations and a couple of minutes for any discussion which might appear from the audience. Yeah, Thank just you. just a question. Do you see the slides? Yes, very well, and we, we can hear you very well also. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for attending this conference. And uh, as it came up again and again that people are very much interested in open science and making data available. So this is our work in that regard. It's a joint work between me and uh, four other members at UIT and uh, they're unfortunately not joining today, but yeah, if you have any questions, just uh, write to me or you can also search them. So as I said earlier, open science and sharing your data set is very much the norm today. And you have projects like Data Wars that ho currently host so many data sets. And if you look at some of the metrics there, there are about 30,000 data sets which are just about social sciences. And they are being openly shared and downloaded by millions of people around the world. And that should be the way I, I really support the notion of open science. but when it has sensitive data in the data set, uh, there could be issues in making it available openly to everyone. And uh, as some of the researchers have highlighted that there are, there's a lot of trust between researchers and a population when they are providing their data. So not everyone is willing to provide you unless they really trust you uh, that you will keep their data safe. And even in many cases where these guidelines have been followed, uh, there are attacks uh, such as re-identification where people were being identified from the data sets. And this becomes especially important in case of Norway, where you have very small villages with populations less than 200 people. And if you just say someone with some attributes, it's really easy to identify those people. And also, as we see in, in the progress of laws, there are laws uh, allowing individuals to have their data removed so it's not about the content but more like revocations so that can affect the data set and we collected some data from the Norwegian ethics committee and we figured out that they were actually going a lot of changes in each projects that they have been approving and we contacted them and figured out these were new researchers being added to projects because they have to be approved first uh, they also relate to new threats that have been have been discovered based on these three identification law, uh, attacks and also the new laws that identified certain types of information as sensitive. But it's not just the laws defining sensitive information, it's also the people. So based on, in our research, we found out that based on who's accessing what, uh, certain parts of information can become sensitive or not. So for example, you might be willing to share your location with your family, but with your doctor, you might think it's sensitive. So a lot of things can change. And also the projects, when they are thought about, they are not where they are thought in this very static way, like, okay, you write in proposal, you get ethical approval based on uh, certain guidelines, 
you collect your data, do your analysis, and then you put the data set uh, in a public repository. But that's not really the case. Many of you might have realized that your project actually goes like this, in which there's a lot of changes. And also, between the time you wrote and proposal and the time you're ready to disseminate the data, there are attacks that you weren't aware of. There are changes that you weren't aware of. And the people might have also changed their opinions. So we started building, based on this idea, we started building a support for a system that can provide uh, dynamic security policies. And also, in uh, while talking to many researchers, we found out that when you have sensitive data in your project, there's a certain tension between making it public. So while your funding agency might say that, OK, you can make it public as long as you're not uh, having any privacy risk in it. So what happens is that these projects end up in silos, and only a few researchers get access to that data. And that's really against uh, open science. So how do we manage to uh, sort out this tension between open research where we want the data sets to be public and also these risks that uh, might exist in a data set. So in this regard, we have built LOPI, which provides a meta distributed metadata layer, which contains uh, and enables compliant data sharing. And uh, the policies are attached to the data set as indicated in this diagram. So subjects and other stakeholders contribute to the data and the policies and if something changes, for example, if someone revokes their consent, those policies can be updated in near real time. And the changes can also come from ethics committees, which are enforcers of the laws that are assigned by data protection agencies, at least in Norway. Just to give you an idea, uh, we integrated LOPI with existing institution IDs so that you don't have to create a new ID to just use it. So in this case, we attach it with our own uh, UIT's uh, ID. So a researcher affiliated with UIT can log in and access the data, uh, check out all the data sets that exist. And uh, yeah, this is a very crude example, but we'll have DOIs specific for each data sets. And then based on uh, the policies that are attached to it. Maybe you are able to check it out or maybe apply for an approval. And once it's approved by the ethics committee or the other stakeholders, you are able to uh, get access to the data quite easily. And also you can check whether you are in compliance with the law or the policies at that moment or not. And if that changes, you are notified about those. And then it can happen that uh, you get steps to correct it. Uh, let's look at the architecture for a second. So on the left, we have uh, stakeholders, usually ethics committees and subjects uh, that provide their data and consent. And uh, the policy store is a central component in uh, LOPI, which contains the historical data for all the policies attached to a data set, when it was changed and by what time it should be applied. And on the right, you can see a data storage network. So we didn't want to build a repository such as Dataverse, but we wanted to work on existing systems. So we allow these data storage network to become um, consist of nodes that are running either at uh, your own personal laptop, could be a web server, could be a server somewhere in the cloud, could be uh, small data centers that some universities and hospitals run. And through, uh, when any researcher wants to access the data, they have to go through this compliance engine, which records and make sure that all the accesses are compliant with the current state of the policies that are in place. Let's look a bit through into the policy store and how the policies are disseminated through this network. So we use gossips uh, over a secure TLS uh, network. Uh, to go through all this network. So on this, you can see there's a policy store on the left and we have two different examples. So instead of sending each update to each uh, node that is part of the network, we use gossip. So in the next uh, slide, you will notice how much work the policy store has to do because if you are thousands of uh, data sets, the 
policy store can become a bottleneck and we want to avoid that. So we use gossip so that the nodes can take over the work for the policy store. And also when it comes to scaling, when you have so many nodes, uh, the policy store cannot keep up with the speed of gossip. Of course, the gossip is probabilistic based, but then it's still much faster than direct messaging to each node. Uh, we didn't want to just build it, we want to do some tests. So for tests, we varied some parameters such as n, which is the number of nodes. In this case, it will be nine. Phi represents how much of the network should receive a gossip before it starts sending another gossip. So let's say if it's two thirds, then in this case, it will be six nodes must receive a gossip message. And uh, sigma is the multicast node. So as you saw earlier, uh, a single node started all this gossiping, but there can be more than one so that it uh, reaches the whole network much faster. In our experiments, we figured out uh, dissemination scales quite well. And uh, the effect of uh, increasing sigma was felt more on the higher when we had more nodes in our system. And uh, yeah. And uh, for overhead at the file system level, so we implemented a few space system to check for compliance policies. And uh, as many different data sets can be of different sizes. So when a file is just four KBs, uh, the overhead was a bit quite large, I would say. But when the file size is reduced to or four megabytes per file, and uh, this is based on reading about one gigabyte of data, the overhead is almost negligible. Uh, we are not done yet. We are also working on a low code policy language so that ethics committees and institu institutional review boards can define what they want in a compliance. Uh, we are working on uh, making a formal proofs of these so that we can actually go to the Norwegian ethics committee and show them. Uh, we have worked on the FUSE implementation, but we are also working with some students on Intel SGX based implementation for enforcement. Uh, we are also working on cloud based services so that when the law is prohibited, the movement of data outside the country, we can provide a cloud based service uh, for researchers who actually exist outside the country. And we have two partners to host sensitive data. So one is from the speed field of sports and one is from uh, fisheries crime in Norway. Um, so in conclusion, we have built a distributed infrastructure which supports compliant data X sharing and analytics. We have designed it in a way that you can have multiple ethics committees uh, and it's very much scalable and the, the data sets can be held at uh, a cloud base or even at a local at institutions. Uh, these are some of the references and get in touch if you have any questions. This probably leads to our web page, I guess. Thank you. If you have any questions, of course, you can post it now in Q&A or just raise your hand. Or of course, as Akash said, you can contact them after the conference. Uh, Akash, I missed two points in your presentation. I'm not sure maybe you mentioned that. Yes, please. First one, this Lochby. Is yes. that some Norwegian word? Or ah, it's a there? Northern Sami word, which means permission. Permission, oh. Yeah, we are actually quite located far north, like about almost 70 degrees north in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we try to take uh, words for our projects as from the local languages, yeah. Okay, that's nice, of course, custom. And how you are defining that uh, policies? Is that in some XML format? Is there some application, some user interface for that, for the definition of the policies? Or yes. So for, for very crude examples, we just use the JSON objects for now. Mm -hmm. But we are working with Harvard University, the the Harvard Medical Center, because they have uh, actual uh, data use agreements. So we want to translate them into. Uh, this language, but then uh, we also came up across multiple uh, uh, languages that uh, have been worked on. So we are not sure on one, but our current implementation uses a JSON based, based language where you define parameters such as uh, which countries, uh, for what intention people are allowed to use, for how, how many days can they have it, 
how, for how many days the data should reside and if the compliance is revoked, what necessary action should be taken? Should it be just uh, asking the researcher or should it be clean wipe or a notification?